So, Tom, we you just heard we're talking about the, the quarterback battles. If you have a question for yeah. Tom, throw in the Booster Club as well. Is there one that you find the most intriguing outside of, obviously, Alabama and Ohio State? Is there one maybe we didn't have on the list? Or out of the ones we had on the list, is there one that maybe you disagree or agree with? No, I think I think a couple – two come to mind for me. I mean, obviously, Ohio State, Alabama, you know, even, even Georgia to some degree uh, are, are the obvious ones. UCLA, I think, is a great discussion. The most fascinating one to me is is Ole Miss. I mean, h- how do you have that collection of quarterbacks in today's transfer portal era mm-hmm. of a guy who's thrown for almost 10,000 yards in Spencer Sanders, right? And then you've got Jackson Dart, who's immensely talented, but just comes up with a way of throwing the ball to the wrong team, right? Mm-hmm. And then you get Walker Howard to come in. I agree with you. I think he's got a tremendous future. They don't have to play him. It's 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 just it just works well. Austin Simmons reclassifies, but I I, I got to get you got to get Spencer Sanders a lot of credit, guys. I mean we're we're in this mm-hmm. this era right now, particularly at quarterback with the transfer portal, where if I'm not playing, I'm out of here. And this guy chooses to transfer to a team that has a, a returning starter, right? I mean I mean that that tells you something about the kid. So you know it's going to be interesting. My only worry about Spencer Sanders is he has been injury prone yep, his yeah, entire career. Right yep, and yeah, and you you have to take that into account. I had them twice last year, and I mean he could barely lift his right arm above his waist, and he's playing. He's tough. He's, he's gutting it out. Um, but if Jackson Dart shows any type of improvement in decision making, and again. He hadn't played a lot either. You know, last year really was his first year as a, as a full-time starter. Mm. I think the other one, the second one that I look at, because I, I'm just scratching my head as to why everybody's just assuming that this guy's going to be the starter, and that's DJ Uyangalale at Oregon State. Mm. I'm actually shocked they took him. I couldn't mm. believe they took him. Mm-hmm. I mean, I would off of tape and off of his performance and the streakiness, the inaccuracy, the inability to put the ball downfield – like, I, I wouldn't have taken him. I think he looks great on the hook, but he doesn't play very well. And uh, there's enough of a sample size, I think, to prove that kind of he is what you see. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that is a football team that could be a sneaky problem in the Pac-12. And maybe he'll be the guy. Maybe I'll be proven wrong and he'll be an entirely different player. I, I don't believe that, but I think that one's intriguing out West uh, for Jonathan Smith. Without a doubt. And, and, you know, when you look at the Spencer Sanders thing, because I do think there's a chance that we see some split reps. If Especially if sure. Jackson's going to get named the starter. If he struggles early, then I think you're going to see it. But I think this is one of the few times where maybe Spencer Sanders, who I don't think is going to be an NFL quarterback, he's dealt with a lot of injuries. Maybe this is a yeah. I want to be a coach when I get done playing move. Mm-hmm. I'm an older mm-hmm. guy going to study under Lane Kiffin. No. Some people said that about, like, people were saying that about Tyler Buckner. I was like, this kid's like 13 years old. You don't do that yeah. when, when you're that age. <laughs> yeah. You're a scholarship guy. That's not why he did that. Those are two totally different situations. But I do find that find that very interesting. Um, Tom, I, I want to ask you real quick, and, and me and you kind of talked uh, uh, about this off air. We're going to get to the expansion stuff. I know, obviously, David wants to talk about that as well. We all do. But... How would you legislate, right? And we, we're living in a crazy world, right? You look at, mm-hmm. at what's going on in the NFL, rookies, you look at what's going on with NIL and the transfer portal. How would you, Tom Luganbill, legislate NIL and the transfer portal uh, at the same damn time? <laughs> I would treat it as best I could like the National Football League. I would treat it like a collective bargaining agreement. And and I say that because we're we're in a – we're in a, a state of college football right now where the players want and get everything that they want, right? right? And that's not how a CBA works. Like in the NFL, right? The owners and the teams, they give some, and the players and, and, and their association, they give some, and you come to common ground. But neither party gets whatever they want, right? So, like, I look at name, image, and likeness right now, and my issue, and I don't know if you guys saw, I was I was speaking to a group of the top 50 underclassmen in, in, in this class, and and I had about a 15-minute session with them, and a little snippet of it we posted on social media, and it's got a lot of mixed reviews, but essentially what I was referencing is the transfer portal, particularly as it relates to players that are in their freshman and sophomore year, haven't even been on campus for two years, and how many of the people in the transfer portal are jumping or are in the portal that aren't even juniors or seniors, certainly haven't gotten towards graduation, 
In essence, what I was referencing is they haven't even competed yet. They haven't even given it a chance. The moment something doesn't go their way, the moment yeah. some, they're not playing or they're not starting or they're disgruntled, what's their first natural inclination? It's to leave, right? Because most of them are, can be very young. They can be very immature. Have you guys looked at a rookie NFL contract and seen how ironclad that is? You should go take a look at it. It's a four-year contract. There are maximum floors, maximum ceilings, and really no wiggle room in negotiation. So in the National Football League, if I get drafted in the first round and I sign my contract and I go out as a rookie and I'm all pro, does that player just get to leave and go throw himself on the open market and find out who's the highest bidder? Nope. Nope. Hey, but let me ask nope. you this, Tom. Does that – does that then open the, the door to having to make them employees? Well, I think we're heading that way anyway. It's a great question. The only way to stay out of court in all of this and to avoid antitrust lawsuits is to make them employees. Remove, remove the scholarship side of it and turn them into employees. That's the only way we stay out of court If you, If you, but, Tim, let, 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 me, let, let me ask you this, though, because I've been thinking, uh -huh. obviously, we all love the sport. We care about the sport a ton. We want to do it the right yeah. way. If they were to bring... And I think we're going this way. If they were to branch off and make a college football commission, right, that, that replaces the NCAA, you know, Greg Sankey ends up being the czar, the emperor, or whatever the hell you want to call it. Is sure. there a possibility, and again, I'm not a legal scholar by any stretch of the imagination, but any way that when you sign a letter of intent or you're going to play within this college football commission, that you're, you don't become an employee, but you sign a waiver saying, I will adhere to these rules because I am joining this organization, this commission or whatever, in the capacity as a player, not as an employee, is there a way that you could structure something like that where then you couldn't go sue them because they signed that waiver? Is there a way to do that? I think there is, but again, that's through collective bargaining, right? That's yeah. Through coming, no, I, to the, coming to the table. I agree. I think there is I'm trying a to way thread the needle. I, <laughs> no, and I, and I hear you, but I guess the point that I'm trying to make is – we're sitting here throwing all this money at all these kids, and then we're basically telling them that if they want to up and leave, they can they can up and leave, and mm -hmm. they're not they're they don't have to to adhere to anything. But that's not what we do in the National Football League with professionals, mm -hmm. with adults, right? We we've got to come to some common ground here where mm -hmm. everybody gets something, but neither side gets everything, everything yeah. that they want. And listen, I'm not I'm not anti-player movement, but I do think that there has to be some standards. There has to be some stipulations that you have to meet. I, I would love to see academic progress tied to it to some degree um, in, in some way, shape, or form. Something that the player has to adhere to because, again, they're under scholarship. They're not employees, which is the other part of the NIL problem, and that is you can't put performance stipulations in their contracts. So yeah. if I sign an NIL deal as a player – and I end up being a bum, mm -hmm. I'm still entitled that money. That's not yeah. how the real world works. That's, yeah. that's insanity. What, why would we be doing that? And that's how it works right now. And the players know it. And there are people out there that have got money to burn, money to lose, and they're so entrenched in their, in their program and they want to lure this kid and they want to lure that kid. Well, my argument would be who is more, more disappointed in DJ Uyunglele, Dr. Pepper or Davo Sweeney? Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> man. Yeah. That's great stuff. This Both is why have we have a case. Time on. I mean, a few of the problems with making these college football players employees and having a union and creating a collective bargaining agreement is these aren't 100% um, private institutions. I mean, these colleges right. get a lot of public funds, right? Like, for instance, with the XFL, if the XFL were just the semi-pro version of the, the NFL, then, you know, you would obviously you would pay guys. What else do they have to trade? They don't have an education to trade. You yeah. know, and the second thing is football is just one of the sports that we're talking about at these 50% public funded institutions. You have a complete collective right. bargaining agreement. You may have every other sport fall by the wayside because they're not profitable, which if that's where we want to go right. and say, hey, if you're not profitable, then we're not going to have a water polo team at this university, then, you know, I'm open for the discussion, but I think my college experience would have been, you know, not as great. And now you have Title IX issues, too. Yeah, it, you're opening up a thing. whole new can that, of worms. That's, and there's going to— This you, whole thing, I guess my point is this whole thing is so muddy, but its current state is not sustainable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, for example— Everybody talks about the transfer portal, the transfer portal, the transfer portal, and player movement and freedom. Let me ask you guys this. Have we seen a team win a national championship or make a college football playoff because of the transfer portal? No. And you know what? We never will. Because 
doesn't matter how many guys transfer here, how many guys transfer there. If you don't have Georgia's resources, if you don't have Alabama's resources, if you don't have Ohio State's resources or Clemson, or, it ain't going to matter. Yeah. We're wi- mm-hmm. We are widening the gap, guys. Everybody thinks, oh, well, the NIL and the transfer portal, it's, it's, it's going to really create parity and it's going gonna, it's gonna to close the window between an Alabama and a Kansas State. No, it's not. Yeah. It's going to well, widen it. Well, it's Tom, widen it. Yeah, I, and I agree with that. My, what I always say is you want to use the tra- a fully healthy program. You want to use the transfer portal to plug the holes in the ship. You, in the sport of football, you cannot build the ship out of the transfer portal. Nope. It's not basketball where there's five guys yeah. on the floor and you got a roster of 13 on scholarship. It is Correct. in baseball where you've got a yeah. roster of, with the NCAA, like 11 and a half guys on scholarship. That's a story for another day. You have, I mean, 85 scholarships. I know there you can change like the 25 you signed now. You got 120 guys, 125 on the roster, whatever it is. It's the ultimate team sport. You there has mm-hmm. to be development. You can't have that much turnover and be able to win at the level right. of these other players that are developing players. Blaine, jump in. Yeah, um, Tom, I'm gonna get the uh, booster here, Luke. That's cool with you. All I'm right. gonna Texas Ed. He wants to know how many transfer portal players are leaving because the school was chosen during COVID without any visits and basically out of a phone booth. I think it's I think it's a great question, um, but I also n- have been around it long enough to know that, unfortunately, most decisions are made almost entirely based on relationships and not facilities, not development, not um, resources, not your stadium, not your crowd or your support. Now, I'm not including where we're at in name, image, and likeness now because prior to COVID or or uh, during COVID. Um, we weren't quite dealing with what we're dealing with now, but I, I remember Lloyd Carr. Lloyd Carr made a great statement. He said, "If you're committing or signing with a school because of a coach, you are making a mistake." Mm. And I agree with that. I coach coach player relationships are super important, and the ones that can manage it and massage it in recruiting on the coaching side are worth their weight in gold, right? But the reality is, it's it's an unstable movement based business. So there better be some substance to your decision when you make that call. You do need to sit down and, and, and whether it's your family or your support structure and talk about the other things involved in being a student athlete, being a student, all right, being on campus, the social side, the academic side, the emotional side. Where do I fit? If football went away tomorrow, well, I like going to school here. Right. So but we we're putting too much stock in a 16, 17 year old kid, generally, most Mm -hmm. of them to really, truly consider the bigger picture. So I I don't know if it was covid. I think it's more that, you know, when you get attached to a certain guy and you love that guy, you'll sign for that guy. And it happens. It happens a lot. And I think that leads to mistakes, too, because let's not forget, once you arrive on that campus, the de recruitment phase starts oh right? yeah and that guy that was loving you up for two and a half years he might be mfing you now up and down in every <laughs> drill right yeah and you're going who who is this guy well yeah. now your maturity starts to come into play right because now your feelings are hurt and now guess what you have self-doubt now you're wondering if i made the wrong decision and all of this not why because maybe you put all your weight into that one relationship yeah. well you know they say about recruiting when i recruit you take on your personality when you come here, you take on our personality. That is very yeah. true. And if there's time, I have one more question. Oh, David, we got plenty of time. Tom, there's an oh, absolute. We have all kinds of time. I'm Tom, not leaving. Tom, staying here forever. Tom, you David. stay here forever because there's an absolute witch hunt going on in Ann Arbor right now. Okay, Jim Harbaugh is apparently negotiating with the NCAA for a four-game suspension to start the season over what I'm calling Burger Gate. Now, my question for you in two parts. I get the brown jug hamburgers are very, very good, but four games seems excessive. No? Yes, but are we are we focusing too much on the meal part of it and not focusing enough on the COVID contact with players? Because that is a big, big no-no, or it was at the time. Mm, or being and, dishonest to the NCAA is another thing people being are talking dishonest about. To the NCAA. I, I think that it's far more those two things than it is the hamburger thing. I think it's easy to grab that because mm-hmm. it's low hanging fruit. Um, but I think when you're when you're dishonest with the NCAA or you pull the old I don't recall, mm-hmm. or you did get caught red handed recruiting and having contact 
during a pandemic, which, and I remember, I remember that time. We all know, you know, the situation that Arizona State went through. And listen, Arizona State and Michigan weren't the only ones doing it. We'd all be naive if we, if we thought that, right? But the bottom line is, if you did it, you got caught. Um, that's where the four-game suspension is. And by the way, guys, I mean, could a, could a nine-year-old fourth-grade girl with a field hockey background coach through those first four games? <laughs> hey, you got Rutgers. I mean, what, what are we talking about? We here? got Rutgers, and Who, East Carolina's on the rise, okay? All right, Tom? <laughs> Which brings me to the second part of the question. Um, could this actually be good for Michigan football? You know, saying they get through those first four games if Jim Harbaugh is suspended, could the narrative now switch from, oh, Michigan's supposed to be great this year and their roster's elite? You know, even the last two college football playoff appearances haven't warranted a lot of the praise that Michigan has gotten entering this season. Now, to me, the narrative can switch. They can say, our backs are against the wall. Let's circle the wagons for our head coach. What do you think about that? Um, I think we might be giving the players too much credit. I'm not sure the players mm. care. And not mm. to mention, from what I've heard, Jim Harbaugh will be allowed to be on campus and at practice during that suspension, correct? I believe so. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's not I official. Think, I, so. I think that's how it's been laid out. So think about it. Think about the minimal, literally, the minimal, smallest, slightest distraction in, in, in all of this is three and a half hours on four Saturdays. Mm. Everything else remains the same. Mm. And I think that the players are mature enough and the staff is is cohesive enough to where if they're worried about their head coach not being there on a Saturday, I think then they're allowing themselves to be distracted. I, I really believe that. I think it's too good of a team, too good of a roster, too much depth, established quarterback now. A lot of people feel like they, they are a, a, a surefire college football playoff team. And we'll, we'll find out if Penn State is what people think they're going to be and if Ohio State develops a quarterback. Um, but I think I think we're probably worrying a little too much about this from the player perspective. Like if it was me, like I can't control it. So why should I worry about it? Yeah. And and they're older, which helps. I, I do. We talked about ex- we were going to talk about expansion. Uh, came out some rumors. And listen, uh, again, it's like high school when it comes to talking about this. You know, obviously. You look at Oregon and Washington, I think they're legitimate candidates to go to the Big Ten to help build that bridge for USC and UCLA, even though, ironically, old AD at USC, Mike Bohm, was trying to put up roadblocks for Oregon uh, because it's such a crazy ge- geographical situation going from, obviously, yeah. the West Coast to having to go out there and play, and not just for football, for the smaller sports that play more games than the football team it's does. It's worse People for that than it is for football. It's way worse because they're going to pump enough money. Like it's Again, less games. We know how much money's funneled in there. Uh, but then Jack McGuire uh, from Barstool said that he was hearing that Clemson and Florida State could possibly jump to the Big Ten. There's no way in hell that happens for multiple reasons. I would be absolutely shocked. Number one, you're not ESPN isn't letting you get out of that contract to go over there with Fox in the Big Ten. Yeah. Number one, if they're going anywhere, it's to a place that is under contract by ESPN. Like I don't know the SEC. So do you think the Clemson Florida State rumors was just, and I I like Jack, I got no problem with Jack, uh, and I don't know who he talks to, but do you think there's any shot in hell that Clemson and Florida State could possibly go to the Big Ten? Question part B, do you think there's a better chance Oregon and Washington end up in the Big Ten than the Big 12? Yeah, I think there's a better chance that that Oregon and Washington would end up in the Big Ten over the Big 12. Um, From the Clemson and Florida State uh, question, you'd have to ask yourself how. Yeah. How would they? How would they do it? I mean, it's uh, in, in it, and even if you attempted to do it, how would you be able to do it in a timely fashion? I don't think you would be able to. So it wouldn't. We might. It might be brought up. And I, I think you're right. I mean, Clemson and Florida State are SEC teams. I mean, yes. that's that's where they would belong, right? And Greg Sankey would jump all over that. And ESPN, my employer, probably would jump all over it um, as well. But uh, that one's a lot more muddy than than I think the Oregon and Washington yeah. thing. And and listen. We keep talking about all this realignment, and and everybody talks about fit or this and that. Fit has nothing to do with it. It's money. It's revenue. That's all this is about. It's about jockeying for position to survive in an eventual super conference type of scenario. And when the music stops, you're not left without a chair. That's that's all. All this is about is is trying to maintain health. Like Colorado, as bad as that program is right now. Colorado just completely cemented themselves mm-hmm. for sustainability, right? Yeah. 
I mean, they, that bottom line, I mean, that, that's what they've done. And what does it say about the Pac-12 when San Diego State at the group of five level steps back and says, eh, I think we're going to wait this one out. Yeah, no, it's, and again, we'll see with the Pac-12 when they announce their deal with Nickelodeon or whoever the hell that is at some point today or, you know, I'm sure the deadline <laughs> was yesterday. But the yeah, CW, don't do, don't man, do they're going to like that, dude. They're the going to air their games after reruns of Dawson's Creek. That's exactly right. <laughs> right before Charmed. It's going to be going to be great. Yes. Can't, can't wait to watch that one. Uh, but, Tom, great stuff, man. Tell everybody where they can find your work. Uh, obviously, the season's coming up, man. You're going to be all over the place. You're like Carmen Sandiego. I mean, where in the world is this guy? Uh, <laughs> uh, I'll be on College Football Live uh, tomorrow and Thursday um, and then littered throughout the, the month of August as we uh, head into the season. And then, of course, on ABC and, and ESPN throughout the fall. I still – we don't know our opening game yet. Um, don't even know, I know our crew, but I can't release that, but we're, we don't know our games yet. So we'll sit and wait for that one, man. Well, we always appreciate it, Tom, when you come on, man. Thanks so much. Oh yeah, Lugs. All right, guys. Have a great week. Hey, YouTube. We are very close to a hundred thousand subs. Thank you so much. Those would be great numbers, even in world war II. Help us get there by subscribing, hit that like button and turn that notification bell on.